Dr. Dennis. <laughs> um, thanks very much for, uh, for agreeing to, uh, to talk to me uh, about this. And it's just be a conversation between us, so you know, forget about the camera or anything else. Okay, well, actually, my, my first question would, would be, uh, what's your earliest recollection of coming out here? Well, as I said, I'm 88 years of age, and I came out here when I was um, 10 months old on a, on a paddle wheeler called, I think it was the Mary Scott. My parents brought me out here. You must remember that Silver Island was the only excursion place close to the lakehead at that time. There are no roads going east or west. And so this was a very popular place, and people were buying cottages. Well, then my parents, uh, I think I was around four or five years of age when they purchased at this building here on the on the beach. So that's about my first recollection of being out here, being out here with my brother, and um, and I'd be about four years of age at that time. Right, right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what sort of activities were were uh, ongoing out here that you recall? Well, uh, funnily enough, uh, the only act we, we used to have organized sports day. We still have them, of course. Mm -hmm. The only really uh, organized uh, activity that I can recall was, um, which few people realized, we had a nine-hole golf course out here. No kidding. And uh, while I didn't play a course, uh, my parents played the occasional, occasional round. And I do remember Ernie Cross coming down with um, a horse and a side cutter and cutting the, uh, cutting the grass. Now this golf course was located, first two or three holes were on the... Um, what we known as the grave graveyard uh, site, and you played those, and then they drove a ball over the creek. And of course, you remember that in those days there, there were very few trees around here. Mm -hmm. Things were wide open. It's all grown in now, but it was very wide open uh, in those days. And they drive over the creek, and there were two or three holes there. And they drive over again, and they'd come out by the old sand pit behind the, the cottage owned by the. Copenhavers now, and it was the Climbies, and there'd be uh, a couple of greens over there in the, near the sandpit. And I, I remember them playing golf as a boy. Wow. Yeah. Well, that was the only organized sport I can remember. Well, of course, we used to have fish derbies and things, and, but I, I didn't take part in those. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, on a daily basis, uh, you know, do you remember any uh, the kids that were out here at the time? Well, uh, there was quite a number of ch ch uh, kids out here. We were getting in towards the, the 30s and um, uh, work was, uh, there wasn't much work around for, for youngsters and, and so the, the young people stayed out here longer in those days and we had quite a crowd. There was, we had that, the, the uh, of course, my brother and I, and then we had the Phil Potts, and then we had the, uh, the Sharons, and, and um, we had the, uh, the Pickles, and uh, the Joneses, the Websters, and all the way down the avenue. I could keep, keep naming these people, but uh, we had quite a crowd of, of young people out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I think I'm almost the last one. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the day before yesterday, they flew Gordy Stinson into hospital from here. How's he doing, do you know? Well, I think Gordy will be probably okay, um, but, you know, as I say, uh, I'm one of what I call one of the few remaining boat people. Now, a boat person, by my definition, is a person who came out here before the roads, on the boat, two cottages that their parents purchased and still have these cottages. Now that, what I, that's who I call a boat person and um, there's very, very few of those left. I think the Thea Cross and and, um, and uh, myself, I, I, I love Lucille, Mac, Lucille Carlson in, in Minneapolis, but they've given up Silver Island just this, this last year. So I'm just about the only person, boat person left. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't like it. It's uh, it's no fun. How long did the uh, boat trip take? From Silver Island to yeah, you know, from town to Silver Island and uh, well, about an hour and a half, two hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I, was, I used to get sick before it left the harbor. <laughs> I, I remember I'd get so excited. They had, the, they, they had um, the Isle of Prince, the one I remember mostly. I, um, and they had the, the Rapids Queen, and the, there was always a race for the slip up at the store. These two boats of competition with the captains. And that was quite a, quite a sight, and everybody would come down to the dock and meet the boat. And, right. And uh, they unload the supplies for the store, and the ice cream would go up in big frozen tubs of ice. And, and the milk, I always remember the milk, it all came out from Kellogg's Dairy, and and it was in boxes, about 12, no, 12 bottles to a box. And the funny thing about it is that you had your, there were paper caps on the bottles in those days, and and you find your name written across the tide. And woe betide you, you couldn't take it. <laughs> That's how they made sure you got your milk. So. so a big scramble for that, big scramble for an ice cream cone. And um, it was a big day when the boats came in. Everybody would be down at the dock. And, and we didn't have uh, mo outboard motors then. We were, everybody was rowing. So people would row down, get their supplies, and row home or walk home. And yeah, it, was, it was a lot of fun. On the boat days. Uh, how, how frequently did the uh, boats come out? Two or three times a week. Um, they used to come out on a... See, in those days, um, a, a lot of people, my father included, they had to work uh, uh, half a day on Saturday. And sometimes all day on Saturday. Well, there used to be an excursion out here on later on on Saturday night. And all the husbands would get off the boat and they'd get home and then get up early in the morning and start sawing wood. Because all we had was, of course, wood stoves for, for cooking. And, of course, this was only in July and August, you know. We didn't, we, there was no road. We didn't drive out here. We were nowhere here in April, May, or June. So it was all July and August. And um, so it was quite busy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always remember that this competition with the docks and the, these two, the yeah, Rapids Queen... And the um, the Islet Prince, they they try and try and get those, try and get the inner slip, <laughs> you see, because the outer slip was too sometimes too rough. Right. So that was always a, an excitement. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a busy time. Uh, another uh, busy event that we have down here was the logging on the peninsula. And. Um, there was a big dam, quite a quite a good sized dam up at Lake Mary Louise. In fact, it's still there. It's being renewed. It was an old wood dam, and they piled the logs into Lake Mary Louise, and um, and then they they drive drive the logs. They let the water go, and they drive it drive the logs down the creek. And they had a you'll find two iron rings, one in front of McQuaig's cottage, and another one out here on the point. And those iron rings, they tied the big boom logs to the iron rings. And they captured the logs as they came down the creek. And the water would rush down, and everybody would watch, rush out and watch these logs come down. And the, the bridge was raised. It went up and over. It was corduroy logs. And it had to be raised so the logs could or it would wipe, wipe the bridge out. And that was exciting. And then the, the tugs would come in, and little tugs, and pull the boom out to... Uh, uh, to Thunder Bay, I guess, and um, that was always exciting, the logging. Well, they, they, the dam is still up there, but it controls the water levels of Lake Mary Louise. Right. Uh, how how um, uh, could, could they drive logs in, in the middle of uh, the summer then? Because, you know, at least now, it, the, the, uh, the creek doesn't run that fast. Uh, Certainly in the, well, in the middle of the summer. Well, I, I can't remember the exact time, but I can tell you it was an awful lot of water came down, and, mm -hmm. and they didn't um, care whether you were camping here or not. I mean, uh, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the same, same situation as all with property, and, you know, and right. they, they, they hollered down. They only lasted a, uh, about a day, you know, and they drive the, drive the logs out of but boy, that water came down the creek with a roar. And that's how you got the, there used to be quite a few good swimming holes up in the creek. 
on the sand pits because uh, right from here to Lake Mary Louise there's a lot of high there's a lot of sand piled up you know 20 30 feet of it in banks and of course those logs coming down scoured the side of the creek and and opened up what we call the boys pool and the girls pool and they were good swimming areas you know there was mm -hmm. sandy bottoms and and, and uh, pr pretty nice swimming yeah so that was a, that was the the uh, the log drives. The other another thing we used to as as a boy, we used to uh, we used to row out to the mine. Now people don't realize it, but when I was out here, you could row to the mine. You could walk around in the mine buildings. And I remember the assay office, and um, was built right over by the where the old shaft mine shaft is underwater. Now it's it's all gone, but most of the um, Cribbings were all all fairly active, and and the mine buildings are there. And I remember running running around in the buildings, and uh, uh, it's all gone now, of course. And uh, sure. so we used to do that. Um, what other things? Uh, well, the old president's house here. That was that was uh, a great old building. You know, people used to rent rent from. And across the state owned owned the well Ernie Cross and then across the state they owned the, the president's house and uh, a lot of uh, people the Thompsons and the Winters and, and uh, quite a number of people uh, rented that each year and there was a lot of activity up at the president's house we used to have a rope ring court and people would play badminton and rope ring up there and, uh, and then when one uh, fall fall it, it burned down. I wasn't out at the time, but it burned. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, the other, another um, other thing I remember about uh, uh, Silver Island was um, the the uh, the herd of, of of milk cows that Ernie Cross maintained. And they had a barn up on Lake Mary Louise. And they had, they had these cows, and he the, he would milk these cows, and they would put it to a separator in the store and sell the milk. I wonder we all didn't die of something, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had an active an active barn, and the, these cows would go down the avenue, and they wander down. They had bells on. And you hear these dong, ding, dong, ding, dong, and they get around in your backyard, and they even so much as rub up against your house here. I recall my father used to bring out fresh vegetables from town and in order to keep them he'd dig a trench just behind the, the cottage here and put the vegetables in to keep them fresh because we didn't have refrigerators in those days. We had sort of um, airy airy cab cabinets in the house and cupboards that would with screens on them but that was it so he put the... I remember how he used to get Furiously, the cows would come in and eat all these vegetables that you brought out of, on the boat. But uh, one other thing about that barn, one day, I, and this was just, this was before the war, or was it after the war? Anyway, I walked around the side of the barn and saw these big humps uh, behind the barn in the water, and they turned out to be sturgeon. Now these, uh, some of these sturgeon were um, up around a hundred pounds or more. In fact, Ernie Cross caught one, and he was selling photographs of it in the store. Uh, hanging up, it was about 120 pounds. And these sturgeon were there. Now, how, what happened was um, a fish, a fish tug came down, and it had a, a number of sturgeon as well as other other fish and it docked at the dock and for some reason it couldn't handle the sturgeon so they the sturgeon was still alive and they just dumped them into Lake Surprise and people found saw them for years but then they, they disappeared now people still think they're in there but I don't think they're there at all but that's another story that um, if it isn't told I guess it'll be forgotten right yeah what else can I say?
But was was the uh, store kind of um, uh, a center of you know social activity at all? Well, the the, the tea room was 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 going full blast. I mean, it, it was always busy, and the store was always busy. But the only organized uh, events were the um, the sports day and the campers bonfire. They'd hold a bonfire, a big bonfire, go up about eight, ten, twelve feet high on the beach. One season, the next season, they'd hold it on the jail beach. And then we always had our sports day. But those are pretty well the only organized activities we had. Well, there was women. Women events, teas, I suppose, people played bridge and all that stuff. Not quite the organization we have now. Right. We didn't have tennis courts. And <laughs> but we had a golf course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, people get surprised when I tell them my parents play golf on the, on the golf course out here. Another thing we used to have was Isle Royal excursions. Um, boats would come in from town, and a lot of us would get together in a big group. And we'd go to Isle Royal for the day. And uh, in fact, I found a ticket for an excursionist over there on my. Okay. Wow. And um, I don't know. Uh, uh, the the only other thing that really stands out in my mind was. Um, and I don't know if I should be even telling this because it's sort of semi-private, but um, uh, they used to hold uh, graveyard seances out here. And Jules, Julian Cross was, uh, had um, persuaded uh, the author Conan Doyle to uh, come out to Silver Island and um, they would hold seances around the grave of Mr. Booker. I hope I'm getting this right. This is my recollection. And one day my wife walked across the creek to go down to her friend's Lucille McQuaig and it was a foggy, very foggy evening. And around about 11, 30, 12 o'clock, I said, I'll, it's foggy, I'll walk down like the children were asleep. So I walked down and pick up Gladys and uh, and just as I crossed the creek, I looked up and there was a glow. And uh, I said, I wonder what that is up in the graveyard. So I walked up and um, sure enough, there, there they were holding a seance. They had a gas light, and light hanging on, on, the, um, on the tree. And they were gathered around uh, Booker's uh, grave. Well, I didn't want any part of that, of course, so I walked and got Gladys and I walked, coming back over the bridge and towards the bridge, and I said, L -l -l you see that light up there? And she looked at it, and I said, well, I told her what it was. I said, do you want to go up and see? She said, no way. <laughs> so she scurried across the bridge. She didn't like that at all. But anyway, they did, and um, and it was, uh, you know, they were, they were foolish people. They were... I guess they were practicing what they practiced. And right. It was it was something to see. And I was at the I I was at by the way I, I was at um, Booker's funeral, and that was before the war. Um, as I told you, the boys out here didn't have jobs in town, and I, I think there was Pat Sharon and, and uh, the Mills brothers, and uh, they were given. Uh, a job to dig. This was in September, just before we, before everything closed down, to dig the grave for Mr. Booker. And I remember going up there because I used to follow these big guys around, and mm -hmm. and they dug this this grave. And I was at the funeral of, of Mr. Booker. I remember there's quite a number of people there, and uh, that was the last uh, burial there. And of course, all the picket fences were all there in the, in those days. It's a shame that uh, they haven't preserved those fences in some way. In fact, I suggested to the manager of the park that they 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 save a few of the the pickets and and reproduce them in in the winter in the, in their in their shop out there and 
restore the picket fences around these graves. The grave sites were, were there and they had these picket fences around. Well, you know what they're, you've seen those and they, but they said that's against the, um, some, against the um, Cemetery Act or something like that. That you don't, you don't restore. And uh, when, I, when I come to think of it, on my trips to England, I go around these old churches and and uh, there's been no work or restoration. They, they, I don't know whether I'm right or not, but that's what they told me. So that's why I think our graveyard is gone. And it's history. It's gone. And the only thing is the Campers Association put a stone cairn there with a plaque on it. So at least we know where, where it is. But we used to play golf all up around them. <laughs> yeah. In later years, baseball. Remember? Baseball, yes, yeah. We had some good baseball uh, games. Um, yeah, who was Mr. Booker, by the way? Hey, he was just a guy from town, as far as I know. He had a, he had a, um, a big boat, a big sailboat, tied up at the wharf. Yeah, I don't know much about him, really. But I know you can still see his, his stone there. It's still his marker. You can see it up there now, still. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, there's all sorts of other things I can remember as a boy, but there, I don't think there's any particular interest to anybody. Yeah. Like what? I don't know. I don't know. We just used to come out here and take our shoes off and put our shoes back on in September and <laughs> I always ran around barefooted. There were no cars when we first came out. And then the cars, of course, they opened the road up and that changed things a lot. We started to come out here in the uh, spring and, and the fall. And they're still here. Mm -hmm. But I, what I don't like is the old, the, the generation flip that's happening right now. Um, I guess there is a generation flip going on all the time, but all the old people, but I, all of us who were in the 80s and early, we're all gone. And then your generation is now coming into play and your children are now all probably going to school or working in the summers and so they're not out here and then but I noticed the beach there's a big crowd of little ones now you know six seven eight ten years of age and they're all down on the beach so there's another little crowd coming and we our group is going and you're coming on and you're gonna go <laughs> and so it goes but we're right in a generation flip right now and uh, well, that's it. Well, you said you're a little bit uncomfortable with, with that generation flip. Do you see it? I, I, well, I'm uncomfortable with it because I'm part of it. And, and I don't want to go. <laughs> okay. If you want to go first and let me know, fine. But <laughs> I, I don't want to go. Um, but, and I'm still, I think, fairly healthy. Still got some of my wits about me, but I'm getting forgetful. But... You know, um, all my friends are gone. And it's the same thing in town. My One of the other partners is gone and so on. And all of a sudden you find, hey, you're, you're old. You're alone. And my mother told me, she said, and she died when she was of 96. And she told me, and she says she has no one in the world left. No one. Not a single person. Uh, of course, she, she knew all the uh, other generations, you know. But, but I'm talking about her generation. Mm -hmm. And her known people, both in England and out here, there was no one. Everybody had gone. She was the last. And I don't want to be in that situation, but it looked like I'm heading into it. I'm almost the last out here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we used to always call well, meet in each other's houses and I used to have big beach parties here where you have everybody in the beach down in the corner here and yeah, but things change I think 
I see the people out here having just as good a time as I do. So uh, nothing's so fine. That's okay. As long as I'm, uh, <laughs> well, it's it's happening. It'll happen to you too. Well, it is happening to you. There's certain, sure. oh. you know, people people that you know. We look. We most recently we've lost younger people. Right. It's happening. Well, it's just natural. But there's no graveyard to go to go into. They don't pop you in out there. Matter of fact, I asked them. Other people have asked them um, whether or not they could use the site. But apparently, there's no reception to that at all. Hmm. No. In in the uh, the graveyard, did you have an ex explanation of why those little houses? Yes. Okay. Those those were those were Indian. Okay. That's the story I heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I presume they didn't, they didn't bury them at all. They just built a cover over them? I, 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 I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's my story. They, they, they were Indian. And uh, in fact, the only, the only there's, there's a, a one gravestone left up there that was carved in, 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 in stone. It's, I think it's a person, a girl named Martin. And that stone is still up in the graveyard, but that's the only one you can read now. Mm -hmm. But when I was a boy, you could read all these wooden, wooden um, gravestones. They're all in wood, they're carved in wood. You could read them all, and there were quite a number of them. About sixty of them, all the way along the, the back end. And um, and it's a, it's it's history, and it's gone. And I don't know why we couldn't maintain it. I still don't. Yeah. I don't know whoever made that ruling, but I don't know why we don't. Why we didn't change it? Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you know, that was that wasn't only here. It was I guess it was in other parts of the country as well. And uh, well, we had the mine. They started to open the mine and up and the last fifty, sixty years. And there was a there was a, a sad thing. They they took they took a lot of the tailings. Into town, transfer the to town. Whether they're going to make a mine out of it or not, I couldn't see any worth in the stuff at all. But it was our history it was being moved, right. and I think it exposed a lot of the cribs, and I think we lost a lot of the mine that way. Mm -hmm. You can still see the if, just if you go out beyond the mine, you know, you can still see down about five or six feet. You see that the, right. the the cribs they extend for quite a way, mm -hmm. and I guess they'll stay. But that's all. So there you go. When um, when the war came up, um, how did things change here and what we hear? Well, the only thing I can remember is what my father told me. He said that there was nobody at Silver Island. You could, it was it was like huh. I used the term death warmed over. There was there was no one around. I mean, the, 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 you know, all the the, the kids were. A lot of them were joined up. I mean, just on this beach alone, I was in the Air Force. My brother was in the Air Force. Rod Philpott was in the Army. Um, Sharon was in the Army, and Mills, one of the Mills, was in the Army, or, and Aubrey Pickles was in the Navy, and you know, so you go. And Gordy Stinson was in the Air Force, and, and we had a, quite a number of, of the young people that were out here. They weren't here, and of course, they would bring people out too. And so, mm -hmm. I remember Dad saying it was it was pretty lonely. You could really notice it. And then it came back. And we lost a couple. We lost well, Duffield Boy and uh, Billy Biggs, Tom Jones. Uh, were lost during the war. I guess there are others, but yeah. Wars are changing now. They don't. We don't lose as many people. Thank goodness. Yeah. You know, they, we're we're fighting wars, and Canadians are fighting over overseas in, in, in Iraq and Iran and and um, Pakistan. Those areas. 
and we, we've lost maybe 120. Yeah. Well, I was on a squadron of, of 14 aircraft on our squadron, 14 of well, five or 600. And we lost, happened to lose three, three that night, and three times seven of 21 men in one night. You know, we lost uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of in those wars, and, and it shows you how stupid wars are, you know. Absolutely stupid. So we lost a lot of, a lot of young fellows out here. And, uh, so we haven't lost any in these wars anyway. Yeah, yeah. What was your experience, uh, you know, being in the Air Force? Well... I was a, Gordy and I were on bomber squadrons, you know, heavy bombers. I was on during the Battle of Berlin, and um, I, I, my logbook shows I did eight, eight trips to, to that city, and uh, we lost a lot of fellas. And Gordy Stinson uh, was hit by fighters, and... Um, I think it was fighters, and he, he they, they had to crash land. And he was he was hospitalized for quite some time. So you know all these all these memories. What was it like coming back then to Silver Island after the war? Silver Island was great. Coming back to Thunder Bay wasn't so hot. <laughs> you had to come back. <laughs> Come back to your your little old jobs. I I worked in the bank and uh, uh, we didn't get a great deal of money, but um, everything was all right. We, as I say, I enjoyed myself out here ever since I've been here. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank goodness for Silver Island, and thank goodness my children are out here now and they've got cottages and uh, so that's good. Mm -hmm. But. Um, and it's a community. And really what makes this community more more than a lot of the other cottages around, I guess in Canada and Thunder Bay, if you go to places like Shabandouin and Amethyst and all these, these places, you'll find that the roads are behind the cottages. And you can see the driveways into the cottages. But here we have a road that goes in front of the cottages. And that makes it a people place. And people enjoy it. You walk down the avenue, I can walk down the avenue, I'll meet three or four people I know, people I don't know, it. hi, how do you, and you feel you're, it, it, it's friendly, it's, it's a people's place. And I think it's a road that's done it. I saw a television program once put on by, Channel 12, anyway, out of Boston, and and they were filming these things, and they showed New York City, and they showed squares in, in parks in New York City with no one in them, hmm. and then they showed other streets where where they, the road was in front, and the parks were in front, and everybody came down to the front, and they were as busy as all could be. It was a became what they call people places. And you can see it right out here, can't you? Absolutely. Don't, don't, you, don't you notice the same thing? Oh, I, I think it's a great observation. Say, say every cottage here, all you could do was come in a back road to get to it. Matter of fact, I'm in the corner and the road doesn't go in front of me, and I notice it. Right. I'm not complaining <laughs> because I'm close to the road, but I don't get the, I, I can see my neighbors chatting a hundred times more than I chat with people going by because they don't go by my cottage. I've got to go by theirs to chat. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, and it's good. It's, it's a people place. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? That's a, that's a great observation. Yeah. yeah. But um, I don't know. I think leave Silver Island the way it is. Um, I do hope the people who are running the present store, I wish them every success. I think they've, they've 
They've done a lot of good for Silver Island. They've brought tourism people in. And some people don't like uh, perhaps the influx of tourists. And, and, uh, but they make it a people place. And um, the, the store, if, if we didn't have these people coming in, the store wouldn't be there and we, we'd be a, a poorer for, for, for that reason. I think the store is still a good meeting place. It's, it's, it's there. And um, I think if we can keep things like the tennis courts going, and uh, that's, there's, I think we're unique there too. I know people of Shibano, and I know people at, um, at Amethyst and these other places, and they, they, they do have campers associations, and they do have tennis courts and things, but they haven't got what Silver Brown's got with that, um, with that pavilion. And the people that organize it and running it, it's, it's well organized, it's well equipped. And we hold successful events there. And we keep a, a tennis court going, and, and, and I think that's good. I, I feel that's all part of Silver Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope nobody steps in and wants to try and downgrade it at all. I think we should keep it going. The other beef I've got, though, and I, it's a real beef, and that is the, the Department of Highways. This being a people place, and that being a public road, I maintain, and we have so many tourists using it, mm -hmm. I maintain that we shouldn't have to form and pay for a road board to maintain the, the mile or so uh, uh, the outside the park, which is what we call the avenue, and the miles or so that's inside the park that, that hasn't been looked after, and it's full of potholes, and we got some stubborn people in the Department of Highways. I think they're individuals because I don't think this edict comes from Toronto or wherever their head office is. It's coming locally to feel that we force us to, to go into a road board. So I've got to put my money in so I've got a great deal of visitors, people, who are, who are um, taking part in the park activities and enjoying the park for what it is, and it's a good thing. Uh, they should be helping to, to it's, it's a public road. Mm -hmm. So let the public look after it. Right. I'm, we're to all taxpayers, so we'll all pay our share eventually. But to make a road board, and then what do we do? We start controlling to say who should come down it? <laughs> no, I think that that's, that's one thing that i got a real beef about, is that, is that uh, the Barnard Highway. Mm -hmm. I think they should fix it. It's only a mile and a half. And it's obvious what they're doing. They're just... There's, the, in fact, I found a guy fishing in one of the potholes on the avenue the other night. <laughs> what is with the boat? Two feet. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> ah, really? Don't you think so? Oh, yeah. I, no, I agree. It, uh... I mean, all we know, we're not asking them to pave it or, or put in curbs or anything. We're just asking them to do some decent pothole repair work. And but keep the, it repaired. The whole idea of the offloading, I think, was not a not a great idea. What do you mean? You know, when the uh, when when the uh, province had to off uh, decide to offload, meaning the, making the municipalities yeah. take care of stuff that yeah. used to be a provincial. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a provincial road. Yeah. yeah. This is part of the park five eight seven. Sure. No, I, I agree with you there. And uh, well, and that's that's my beef with the government. And the other beef I've got with 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 the government is 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 um, uh, taxing it's out here. Mm. Uh, we're paying school school taxes. And t taxes, in my estimation, are are levied to pay for services that you're getting. And whether or not you have a school or not doesn't make any difference. If you're living in Thunder Bay and they have schools, you you will be paying taxes, and that's the way it is. Out here, we're at the end of Sibley. There is no one going to school here. There is no, there's no part of education here. 
And so I don't think we should be paying school taxes out here. Right. And, and, um, but we are, and we appealed it. And our representative said we, we were going nowhere with it. And so that's the way it is. So the other day I got my assessment and I paid it. But for what? I mean, I'm paying taxes for what? Show me what I'm paying for. Yeah. I'm not up at Pass Lake. Right. Or not in Shunia where we have a school and you're living in the community where your children are going to those schools. Then you should be paying for it. I mean, are, are, how far do they extend these taxes? Did they go up into the, to the reservations and everybody up in the north and have them uh, start paying for, for, for the roads? I don't think so. They don't pay them, do they? Unorganized territories, whatever it is. I don't know, it's just a beef. I'm paying it. It's not going to kill me or anything. <laughs> But that's the way it is. How, how did you meet Gladys? <laughs> how did I meet Gladys? Yeah. Well, I was flying, um, flying at uh, a place called, um, what was it? Uh, Anstey. And I went into a pub one night close to a, a village near the Church of Offord. And there were these nice young girls there, and we were nice young young men, <laughs> pilots, yeah. And so we we all had a good time, a good ch chance, and one of them invited me to come down to another little party the next next week, and um, and so I went down there and I married her, <laughs> and it was and it was fine. Uh, were you married uh, in England? Married in England, yeah, mm -hmm. by an Air Force padre. And we've, uh, yeah, lost her 10, 12 years ago, and no fun. Yeah. Yeah. And and her um, her niece, her sister's girl, Denise, Has been out here quite a number of times. Mm -hmm. She is going to be arriving here on the twenty third day of August, oh. or is it the no? Anyway, she's going to be here with her husband. Great. So they're they're going to be here. So that's nice. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I like England. I I I. It's a nice country. It's, um, I'd say it's law-abiding, basically. I think that the United States uh, are, are, are in a hell of a mess as far as uh, obeying the law. And I think Canada is a lot better than the United States. And I think England is a lot better than Canada in law-abiding. People, the people themselves are law-abiding. They haven't got people pushing to keep people from breaking the law all the time. And people are obeying the law. Right. And they don't do it. And, 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 and it's a, I think it's what they call it, it's a have, have not society. And I, I'm, not a, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a communist or anything like that, but I think we have to look after people. And it seems to me in the States they haven't looked after enough people and that people are taking the law into their own hands and it's going out of control. And here it's beginning to do that, but but we've got more more uh, service for for um, our older people and our and, and more um, government protection there, mm -hmm. and um, you don't want too much of it, but you've got to have enough. And over in England, they're even better. In fact, they're going almost bankrupt because of it. <laughs> but they're more law abiding. And, well, am I right or am I wrong? I, no, mean, I think you're right. Yeah. You know, I, what I read about what's going on down there now and that oh, with, yeah. with, with the law. The police are, the police are, are they're not supported. 
the way they, they should be. The police are there for your protection. Why not just support them? They, they think a lot of the police in England, and they think they're, they're okay here. They're okay here, but I don't know if they're really supported. No, I mean, that's not everywhere. I, I go down to the States all the time, and, I'm, and I don't see any any crime going on, and I, I'm, it's peaceful. Mm-hmm. Sure. But you get in, but you get into the inner cores of these these cities and that, and boy, it it doesn't sound good. And how do you stop it? You know, if you if you, you let everybody have a, a a fairly decent try to get a decent kick at the cat, then you won't have as much. Yeah. But you won't do it by by people making a billion dollars and saying that I've made mine, you can go make yours. Yeah. It's not right. Very off balance. Yeah. I don't believe in just taxing everybody to, to, to you know, out of not able to do anything. Just confiscation. I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. But I think you can do some more. You could take some of the stuff that we're doing over here, you know, to, to, to um, would help. I mean, we, we, we don't have the, the we, we have a national debt, but we're not in crisis like you are. Mm -hmm. And why are, why are we, why are we, what is it, just management? That's right. I mean, what, we're no much different than you people. I don't see any difference between you and me. So, I don't know. Well, there's some very... Uh... Of course, I'm, what I am, I, when anybody starts running down the United States in the military, I get really mad because you people, Americans, are, they've got the, the aircraft carriers, they've got the, the Air Force, they've got the Army, and they're doing way more than the rest of us. And they're over there, and their boys are getting killed. And the old ta taxpayers are keeping these fleets of uh, uh, armaments going. They're keeping, the, as I said, all the aircraft carriers and the Air Force, they keep, they're keeping it going. And the taxpayers are paying for it. And that's part of the, that's part of the deficit. And I don't like people running down the United States and say, go and do it yourself. In fact, if I was an American, I'd say, bring them all home for crying out loud, fight your own war. Right. You know? No, that's not right. I'm not anti-American. No, not a bit. Mm -hmm. No, sir. I don't know, Tom. I, what the hell? Is I don't know if I've even covered Silver Island enough for you. I don't know. I appreciate you You're talking to me, though. Well, I've been spouting off, but I think that's what you wanted, didn't I? Whatever happens. Yeah. You know. I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think your grandkids will, and their their children. You know, that's. I don't want to see it. It's one of the things I, you know, wanted to um, to paint a picture of a place that is still, but isn't. You know, at the same time. Yep. Well, if we don't change it too much, it can still keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've covered both of the things I could, I could think of. There's lots more, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah.